I get to see firsthand the impact that you're having um, on your neighbors across this great nation. And I am in your debt as are tens of millions of people who benefit from, from what you do all the time. And the bottom line, the point is that Feeding America's reach is we are wherever there are people facing hunger. And being as there is not one county in this whole great nation where there are not people struggling with food insecurity, that means that there is no county, and I'm from Louisiana, so I say parish also, there's no county and there's no parish across this great nation where there are not people who are struggling with food insecurity. So we try to be where they are. And you are part of the reason that we're able to do that. And we sincerely, sincerely appreciate that. Thank you. Welcome to Farmside Chat, and I'm your host, Zippy Duval, president of American Farm Bureau. And I'm proud to be with all of you again today to have a great conversation around feeding America and, and feeding the people in our country that need it so badly. You know, this last year in 2020 was very difficult for a lot of us. Uh, agricultural farmers and ranchers and rural communities had a difficult time through the pandemic. And we have been working real hard at American Farm Bureau to try to solve some of the problems that come along with the pandemic. Uh, but, you know, you can't think about this pandemic without thinking about all the uh, uh, wonderful people that had very difficult time because so many people got laid off or lost their jobs because of the uh, COVID. And then our farmers uh, actually lost their markets in a lot of cases. A lot of our farmers uh, shipped straight to food services and other uh, places like that. And then all of a sudden... When pandemic come on, um, everyone had to go to the grocery store and were cooking at home again. Uh, so it made it very difficult for our farmers to be able to market their their foods. But today, I, I have uh, the honor uh, and privilege to have with me the CEO of Feeding America. Uh, her name is Clara uh, Bobanow. Did I say it right? That's close enough, Zippy. Uh, Bob, Bobanow Fontenau, and uh, she's with me today, and she's the CEO of uh, Feeding America, and we look forward to having a conversation with her because a lot of the things that farmers do each and every day uh, are going out and making sure that we produce uh, healthy food for Americans and a lot of people around the world. And I know that a little later on, we'll talk a little bit about the relationship uh, between Farm Bureaus and Feeding America. It uh, has a pretty rich history. Of talk, we can talk about that. But first, Claire, I would love for you to uh, tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and how you came to the work at Feeding America. I'm happy to do that. So first, let me say thank you. Um, thank you to you, Zippy, and the team at Farm Bureau for inviting me to participate here um, one of my main reasons that I was so excited by this opportunity was that it would also give me a chance to say thank you to all those farmers out there. I get to see firsthand the impact that you're having um, on your neighbors across this great nation. And I am in your debt as are tens of millions of people who benefit from, from what you do all the time. So let me start there. Um, and then I'll, now I'll talk a little bit about me, as you said. And by the way, the way my mom raised me she would have been disappointed if I didn't start with that thank you. So thanks for indulging it. Uh, so I'm from a really small town, agricultural town out in South Central Louisiana. It's called Opelousas, Louisiana. When I grew up, in fact, uh, it was such, uh, agriculture was such an important part of that city's dynamic or that town's dynamic that I in the band marched in the Yamboli Parade I went to the big Yamboli Fair and I was even my, um, the reception for my wedding was held at the Yamboli Auditorium, all in Opelousas, Louisiana, because we used to hail ourselves as the sweet potato capital of the world. So uh, came up in with deep roots in the agricultural South, not, uh, while not in the same state, Zippy, I think we might've been brought up in similar ways, you and me, with our backgrounds. But one place that we might be different is that when my mom was expecting me back in 1963, um, she learned that there's these two little kids in a neighboring town who were suffering from neglect and abuse. And 
While my dad was away at work, she went pick those babies up and brought them home. My dad got home and his family had doubled. <laughs> and from that moment forward, my mom and dad would make a lot of trips like that one. And over the course of their lives together, uh, they were mom and dad to 108 children. Wow. Including the very, very privileged one who's who is on this program right now. So I came up in an environment where I knew about hard work. Um, I knew about that there was want and need in the world. I knew that human beings have a lot of capacity for helping to serve that need. I went off on this career where I got chances to do things that my grandparents and my parents had not gotten a chance to do. My parents didn't even get to graduate from high school. I got to graduate from high school and then college and then law school. And then I got another in LLM and my mom's like, what was wrong with that first degree? Um, that first law degree. <laughs> So I had all of these chances to move forward and do lots of things professionally. I worked as a lawyer in a law firm. I worked in before accounting. Um, Walmart was one of my clients when I was in the law firm and they asked me to come in house. I spent um, right at 13 years at Walmart, became an executive at Walmart, executive vice president of finance at Walmart. I always said I had a head for numbers and a heart for people. And then um, in 2015, I learned that I had cancer and everything changed. And I realized, and I asked myself a question, I won't forget the question. And the fact that I'm here tells you what the answer was. As wonderful as the Walmart experience was for me, I asked myself, what if the last thing that I could ever do professionally was the last thing that I could do at Walmart? Would that be okay? And my answer was no. So. I started the process of leaving and thank heaven and God and above that I got the chance to do this work at the moment that I'm in right now. I can't imagine doing anything else right now that would give me greater satisfaction than getting to do the work that I do with uh, great partners like the farmers who, who are listening in and watching. Wow, what a great story. And obviously the big heart that your parents had uh, it lives on in you. Do you still have your parents, Claire? My mother's now passed on and my father is 82 years young, still living in Opelousas. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I was just over there two weeks ago and he's got me like on a schedule. It's about time for me to go back to Opelousas and I'm sure he'll, he'll start getting people to call me and say, and then he'll be in the background saying, hey, ask her, when is she coming to see her daddy? So I'll be going to see my dad again soon, I'm sure. Well, I know I know he is uh, very proud of you. And, and that same uh, story that you told also lives in a lot of the hearts of our farmers and ranchers across America because, you know, I, I don't know, if, I, I know you know this, but, you know, growing up, you know, all the farmers had a garden. They didn't just farm, milk cows, take care of chickens and, and, and plant a crop, but they all had a garden for their family. And of course, a little garden will produce way more than your own family to eat. And probably some of the most joyful times I spent with my dad and my granddad was going down the road and sharing that bountifully uh, harvest out of our garden with neighbors, especially uh, some people that maybe have been widows or or didn't have as much as we had. And, and they just always had such a good time doing that. Uh, so our farmers around America think that same way about their communities. Um, and, and, you know, it, it makes me think of a Bible verse. You mentioned the Lord and taking you where you're at. A Bible verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 14, it says, let all of you do, uh, uh, what, let all that you do be done in love. And I can see that in everything that you do at Feeding America and all the people that work for you. So we very much appreciate the relationship that we have had at American Farm Bureau with Feeding America. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But, you know, I was first president of American Farm, uh, uh, Georgia Farm Bureau and our counties did a tremendous amount of work, never went to a Farm Bureau meeting if we wasn't taking up food and making sure that the food banks were getting that. And, uh, and all across America last year, we saw uh, Farm Bureaus donate $5.4 million and 1.4 million pounds of food 
uh, over during the pandemic, even though they were going in through some tremendous difficulties too. But we, we all uh, remember those empty shelves of last year or during March. And uh, none of us hope, we hope we never see that again. And it didn't have anything to do with the lack of food. It was the way, how we got our food to the people that needed it because the markets changed so much. So uh, could you tell us uh, the challenges that you, that y'all saw at the food bank early on in the pandemic and, and what, what, because I know the demand was huge and that was quite a, I'm sure quite a challenge for you. No, it absolutely was. And I want to touch upon something very quickly and then I'll get straight to the, to your question. So the first thing is, I know about having those gardens too. We lived in the city limits of Opelousas and my dad decided not only would he grow okra and tomatoes, but he also grew corn. Now imagine what that looks like in a subdivision. So my dad, my dad had these big old stocks of corn. It was quite hilarious, at least for us, not so much for our neighbors. But um, you're right. Uh, it was it was quite quite challenging. We refer to it as a perfect storm last year. So one of the primary places that we receive food as a network um, across the country. We have 200 member food banks, over 60,000 agency partners. Lots of people who are our partners don't even realize that they're part of the Feeding American Network. It could be a church basement um, where there's a pantry that is being supported by, by the work that we do as a network. So we saw um, some significant increases in need. In certain cases, we had certain food banks that saw a 400% increase in, in need, 400% um, at a moment in time. It was quite challenging. We saw supply dry up for lots of the reasons that you said. Um, one of our primary resources for donated food has been retail. If you look at an empty shelf, then they're not donating any food if the shelves are empty. So we had those challenges there. Um, and, and then the breaks in the system that you talked about before. And it, it's one of the things that I've really felt uh, and every chance I've gotten to talk about it during, while it was happening, and you'd see these images sometimes of farmers who were having to to get rid of things that they produced. And I've had people kind of, um, in my opinion, judge harshly a farmer who was forced into a circumstance that they would never want. I'm like, you must not know any farmers. If you think that a farmer would grow something to throw it away, then you don't understand farmers. You must not know farmers. There's a break in the system that's forcing farmers into these decisions. This is not who farmers are. And I, the partnerships that we've had resulted in us being able to work together and to match that food up with people who need it. Because like you said, our issue has never been that there's not enough food being produced in the country. It's matching the food with the people who need it, which became a big challenge. So big peaks in, 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 uh, in demand, along with reduction in supply. It required a lot of innovative partnerships. Among those innovative partnerships was definitely our partnerships with farmers. And all together last year with the outreach that we have across the spectrum, our network was able to provide 6.1 billion meals to people. Wow. 6.1 wow. billion meals in no small thanks due to uh, the people who will be listening in and watching this broadcast. So thanks again. I mean, it's just remarkable. The need was great and you guys stepped up <laughs> in, in beautiful, beautiful ways. Well, it's amazing how people step up. You know, when all this started, we reached out to your organization and says, you know, let's make a, let's make a, write a letter to the secretary, uh, the you know, secretary for due and, and, and ask him to put together a program to help us get some of that food that was being thrown away and plowed under. And you're right, that's the last thing a farmer wants to do. He doesn't want to grow a crop and plow it under or throw it away or have to get rid of it. But he, he wants somebody to utilize that. And through that letter, uh, we I think you and I and our organizations uh, played a major role in helping them decide to start uh, the Farmers to Families food boxes that uh, touch uh, millions of America, Americans across our country. So uh, what did you, what success did you see in that letter? And uh, I mean, 
in that letter and our efforts to do that. Oh yeah, great success. And it's, you know, I often talk about the fact, I know that there are lots of things that, that we don't agree on as a society right now. But one of the things that we can agree on is that in this country, there's no reason for anyone to be without food. And the fact that we have uh, partnerships like the one that the ones that we've had for such a long time with Farm Bureau, when it really counts is at moments like that, right? And boy, uh, working together and being able to reach out to Secretary Purdue and then having him and the team respond as quickly as they did and getting that fresh produce um, from fields into people's bellies. And again, I one of the benefits of my job, Zippy, is I actually go out to food distributions. I'm gonna be leaving for food, dis- food distributions next week, in fact, again. And, and I'm out there on the front lines witnessing people receiving this food when they were feeling desperate. And then they look and they've got a box that represents this beautiful harvest. Um, so I get to to be the on the other side of of what's happening on both sides of what's happening. And it's really something magical uh, when people have that outreach from their neighbors and from the labors of a farmer. So that's been highly successful. Thirty nine percent of the food that we distributed last year was through uh, federal commodities. Thirty nine percent of that six point wow. one billion meals from last year. So a huge percentage of what we were able to do, we did because of our partnership with you guys. It's a really well, thank big deal. you. And it, it really was a big deal. And I, I I was so proud that American Farm Bureau and your organization at Feeding America kind of helped kick that off and, and it did touch and help so many people in our community. But to build on the relationship between uh, Farm Bureaus and, and Feeding America, uh, we started hashtag still farming because there were people uh, out in the countryside that was seeing those empty shelves saying, well, you know, we're not getting to go to work. We're all working from home. Is our farmers, are they still going to be out there? Are they still going to be working? And we wanted to assure that the American people, that the farmers will continue to work and get that done. And, and, and we need to understand how important it is for us to keep on making that connection with, uh, with our food banks and with Feeding America to uh, make sure that we help with the people that continue to have needs, even though we're coming, hopefully coming to the end of this pandemic, there's always gonna be people in need, uh, in need of our help and the food that we produce. Uh, So uh, to continue that support, uh, we also have started uh, 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 Hashtag Still Farming partnership in in some uh, t-shirts and apparel that you can buy and the funds from that goes to uh, the Farm Bureau Foundation that helps teach children about agriculture. And the other half of it goes to your organization to continue to help uh, feed people. So we would encourage people to go to uh, farmbureau.org slash still farming and learn more about uh, those products and be able to help us move forward in, uh, in helping people, even though we are hopefully coming out of this pandemic. So uh, could you tell me what you think the importance of the hashtag still farming partnership is? Well, I think number one, the partnership we've already touched upon, right? And we won't have enough time for us to go through the list of all of the remarkable things that we've done together in this, this partnership. But I think it's really important to send that loud, clear message that farmers did never take a break during this pandemic, by the way, uh, you are still farming. and and that we ought to support your efforts. And we're excited by the fact that my mom, who we talked about her not being with us anymore, it is actually, we are broadcasting this. We're doing this on her actual birthday, by the way. And I don't believe in coincidences. This well, is happy birthday, birthday, mom. Happy birthday, mom. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and you know, and my mom said, you can tell a lot about a girl by the company that she keeps. So the fact that we get to, that we get to partner with an organization with your reputation and brand, um, your dedication to to producing good for the country, I think says a lot about feeding America that we get to sit alongside partners like you guys. I hope that the work that we do um, is work that you can feel proud of too. So that when when you talk about the association, that it goes both ways, if you will, because I certainly know that we are are certainly the beneficiaries of this partnership on our side. So I encourage everybody to go out to that very same 
hashtag. And if you want to know more about what Feeding America does as a network, if you go to feedingamerica.org, one of the good things about that website is number one, you can educate yourself on hunger in America. You can come to understand details around whom it is that's struggling with hunger. And another thing that we have on there, we have something called a food bank locator, which I love that feature on the website because I know for myself, I don't live in the town that I grew up in. And many farmers have the, the beautiful benefit of the fact of that they do, but not all of us do. So if you want to provide resources for the community that you grew up in, all you do is put in the zip code for that community and it'll tell you which food bank is serving that community. Or if you went to school in a place and you have a special affinity because that's where you met your husband or that's where you met your wife, you can put in the zip code for that community. And the bottom line, the point is that Feeding America's reach is we are wherever there are people facing hunger. And being as there is not one county in this whole great nation where there are not people struggling with food insecurity, that means that there is no county. And I'm from Louisiana, so I say parish also. There is no county and there's no parish across this great nation where there are not people who are struggling with food insecurity. So we try to be where they are. And you are part of the reason that we're able to do that. And we sincerely, sincerely appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Claire. And it's been a privilege to have Claire Bobineau Fontenot with us today. You got it. And, there uh, you go, Zippy. I got it. I got it down right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's been a pleasure to have you with me in, uh, today, and I hope we uh, continue to, I know we will, continue to work together. And, you know, I'd like to just say to everybody, you know, um, you, you know, it, it doesn't make any difference how bad you think your situation is. You don't have to look far to see there's others that have it a lot worse than you do. That's and point. if you really want to make yourself feel better, uh just help somebody find the food that they need. Yes. Whether it be give to a food bank or just uh, pay for somebody's meal that's behind you in the, in the line when you're going through a drive through window. If that doesn't make your heart feel good, there's something wrong with you and you need to recheck uh, what, what's it, it's your principles. So I would leave us all with uh, that verse I mentioned earlier, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all you do be done in love. And if we do that, I know this is going to be a wonderful country and world that we live in. And we'll continue to make wonderful new friends like I've made with Claire. Thank you, Zippy. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you all. Thank you, Claire. God bless you and your organization and what all you do for the people that need across this country. We'll keep trying. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Farmside Chat. Please be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And while you're at it, take a minute to rate and review the podcast. This helps us continue to bring you farm fresh content that everyone can enjoy. Until next time, thank you and God bless you.